Ave Maria. We have this special time in the Legion, a day of reflection, and we all usually have it around the beginning of September, around the birthday of our Blessed Lady. Now we are celebrating our Lady's birthday on the 8th of September. There are only three people whose birthdays the Church celebrates. At least their birthdays in this world. When we celebrate the feast of a saint, we celebrate the day of their death, that is, the day they died in the body, separation of body and soul. But what we're celebrating is their birth into eternity, because they have, like the, the um, butterfly, they, they fully mature and they can fly to heaven. But the church celebrates the birthdays the, of three people. That is, the days when they were born into this world. And the three people are our blessed Lord, his mother, and St. John the Baptist. If we start with um, St. John the Baptist, why does the church celebrate his birth into this world? Essentially because he was born without sin. So he came into this world sinless, which is a privilege the only other person we know of for sure in Scripture, in the Old Testament, is in fact the prophet Jeremiah, where, the, where we read in the first chapter that um, I was sanctified in my mother's womb. In the case of John the Baptist, his father, Zechariah, is in the temple offering sacrifice when the angel Gabriel appeared to him and said to him that he, his prayer was heard and that he would become a father, that his wife would become pregnant. And he didn't believe it. And the angel went on to say it would happen, and he said specifically even referring to John the Baptist, even in his mother's womb, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is essentially to be sanctified, to be made holy, because the Holy Spirit cannot be where sin is. So when we are baptized, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. When we, may, when we go to confession, the sin is um, forgiven, the stain is removed, and we are again filled with the Holy Spirit. So throughout our lives, we are being sanctified. That's why it's important that we go to confession as often as possible, so that we can always live filled with the Spirit. So John then, with the angel said, will be filled with the Spirit in his mother's womb. Well, how is that going to happen? We're told Zechariah went home, his wife, who was advanced in age and had been barren all her life, she couldn't bear children, didn't bear children, um, that she's pregnant. And in the sixth month um, of her pregnancy, Our Lady visited her. And Elizabeth, we're told, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Elizabeth says, the, what have I done? What, how do I deserve this? That the mother of my Lord should visit me. And then she goes on, and don't forget, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. She goes on to say, The moment your greeting reached my ears, the child in my womb leapt for joy. Yes, blessed is she who believed the promise made her by the Lord to be fulfilled. And it's from this that Our Lady sings her Magnificat, which we just recited. So John then is filled with the Holy Spirit. Our Lady speaks, Elizabeth hears, but John senses the presence of the unborn Christ and salutes him, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, he's the one who's filled first. And then there's the overflow 
into his mother, who then becomes a prophetess. So then John, sanctified in the womb by the very presence of Christ, carried by Our Lady in her womb, John is sanctified. John is a saint, and he's born that way. So that's the reason we celebrate, the Church celebrates, the Feast of John the Baptist. And she does so when? On the 24th of June, six months before Christmas. Because, as you know, our Lord has just conceived, Elizabeth is already in her sixth month. And of course, we celebrate the birth of our Saviour in December, December 25th. So that's the reason that John is, John's birthday is celebrated. Similarly, we, well, for our Lord, it's very easy because he is the Son of God. He is God. He is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. He is the Word of God. He is consubstantial with the Father. And that word, which we recite in our creed, consubstantial, means he is of the same substance. So whatever the Father is, so the Son is. The Father is God, the Son is God. The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal. The Father is all-powerful, the Son is all-powerful. The Father is all-wise, the Son is all-wise, and so on. So whatever the Father is, the Son is. Except the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. So that's the only difference between them. But they are both God, inasmuch as they possess the fullness of the divinity. This is the mystery of the Trinity, which doesn't concern us at the moment. So, our Lord, being God, he could not sin. He cannot offend himself. So, he is born, he takes to himself human nature. He is conceived in the womb of the Virgin. When Our Lady answered the angel, let it be done to me according to your word, at that moment, the word became flesh. And so our Lord, in the womb of his mother for nine months. So in a sense, we could say about Our Lady, she was his first tabernacle. What is the tabernacle? It's a place where we keep the blessed sacrament. Our Lord, under the appearance of bread and wine, lives there. But he lived first and foremost in the womb of his mother. So Our Lady is his first tabernacle. And when he is born, and we celebrate that on Christmas Day, he comes forth and he is at her breast. When the wise men find him, in fact, even before the wise men, when the shepherds came, they found Mary and the child. If they didn't find our Blessed Lady, they would not have found her son. Where did they find him? They found him at her breast. And so we can say that Our Lady is the first monstrance as well. Because a monstrance is that vessel in which we display, we show our blessed Lord. And so, sitting on her lap, sitting on, 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 at her breast, our Lord is, in fact, very much in a human monstrance, his mother. And so that's how the shepherds found him, found by finding her. That's how the wise men found him, by finding her. And we also will always find him as long as we remain close to her. So then, we celebrate his birth at Christmas because he is without sin. In the case of our Blessed Lady, this is even easier because we celebrate our Lord's incarnation. That is, the day the, uh, Our Lady agreed to become the mother of God, when the angel said to her that she would conceive after a few questions, she said, let it be done to me according to your word. So we call that, the, 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 the word becomes flesh at that moment, the second person of the Blessed Trinity became flesh, became man. The Son of God became the Son of Mary, that's the incarnation. And we celebrate that on the 25th of March, exactly nine months before we celebrate Christmas. So, in the case of Our Lady, likewise, we celebrate her immaculate conception. And we celebrate that nine months 
before her birthday. So the 8th of September is her birthday. We go back nine months and we come to the 8th of December and we celebrate her Immaculate Conception. Now, the Immaculate Conception means that from the very first moment of her existence, by a singular privilege, a great gift given to her by God in anticipation, okay, in anticipation of the sacrifice her son would make on Calvary. She was preserved from contracting the sin of Adam. Now, the sin of Adam, for us, is not something positive. It is not something we have done. It is something negative. It is something that we are missing. Okay. What are we missing? Well, we're missing what Adam had, namely God's grace. Because the most important gift we can have from God is his grace, his love, his life, his presence in us. Now, Adam was created in that condition, in that state, inasmuch as he was without sin. We're told that God used to walk in the garden with him. But when he sinned, immediately he put a barrier between himself and God. And as a consequence, we who are his children, his descendants, we have this barrier. This barrier can only be bridged, it can only be broken by baptism. When it's broken by baptism, we then become children of God. We're able to have God's friendship, God's life once more in us. So original sin is something negative, it's something that's missing. It's a bit like being blind. You may have eyes, but you cannot see because you're blind. What's, what's missing? What's missing is sight. So blindness is not a thing, it's not something, but rather it's something that's missing, a lack of something, and the something that's missing is sight, the ability to see. So original sin is a bit like that. Well, Our Lady, because she was to be the mother of God, the mother of Christ, the mother of Jesus, the mother of the Savior, the mother of the Messiah, because she, this was the reason God had created her, she was given the grace, that, that friendship with God that Adam had, that the angels have. She was given this. So from the very first moment of her existence, she was without sin. And in growing in her mother's womb, she was born likewise without sin. So we can celebrate then her birthday, which is what, as legionaries, what we're doing. And so these are the three people whose birthdays we celebrate. That is, our Lord, our Lady, his mother, Saint Joseph, I'm um, saying John the Baptist, his cousin, his precursor, the one that go before him. Now, when we celebrate Our Lady's Immaculate Conception, when we celebrate her birthday, we're celebrating essentially God's great work. God, what is God's greatest work for us? It's nothing other than our redemption. That is God's great work. The greatest thing God can do for us is to redeem us. Our Lord said, what is a prophet a man if he gains the whole world? and suffers the loss of his own soul. Or to put it another way, what is the point of us being king, queen, president, very rich, very well-known, skilled in everything, musicians, footballers, film stars? What's the point of all of that if when we die we go to hell? But if we are poor and suffering, and the most miserable people on earth, and we save our souls, we end up in heaven for all eternity, we've achieved our life's work. That's why our Lord, when he, be, when he spoke the Beatitudes, the first thing he said, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So he's telling us that to, to lose everything in this world 
is worth gaining heaven. And this is something we must remember always and all the time, that we are working for eternity. We are working for eternal life. We're working for happiness forever. So when we look at the lives of the saints, we see a great number of them suffered. They suffered either because of what people did to them, in the case of the martyrs, or they suffered because of what God did to them, as in the case of the confessors. So they endured hardship, hunger, thirst, insult, beating, misunderstandings, ridicule, and all of these things. And what did they do? They accepted it as God's will. And we can think of a very, very good example in the case of Job. You know, when he lost his property, the sheep, camels, and so on, he lost those. Then he lost also his children. Okay, all, all of them were killed in a, in a whirlwind. What did he say? The Lord has given, the Lord has taken back. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then when he lost his health, and he was really miserable, and he was suffering a great deal, and he had friends who said to him, this is happening to you because you're a bad man. What did they say? If we receive good things from the hand of the Lord, is there any reason why we shouldn't receive bad as well? And in all of this, he accepted God's will. And that is the key to our happiness, and especially this is the secret of our Blessed Lady, God's will. Let it be done to me according to your word. And for that reason, we should keep close to Our Lady because she will always show us how we can fulfill God's will. Now, there's, there are many secrets uh, about Our Lady, which as legionaries we can read, for instance, in the works of St. Louis Marie de Montfort. Or we can read in the great devotees, the great lovers of Our Lady, St. Bernard, St. Alphonsus, to name but two. But there are also others, St. Thomas, Aquinas, you know, St. Albert the Great. There, there are so many. But whenever we read about Our Lady, we'll always find that the saints never cease to praise what God has done in her. And that's exactly what Our Lady said in the Catena. For he that is mighty has done great things to me. Holy is his name. And similarly for ourselves, you know, we need to recognize that we are not doing God a favor. When we do good as legionaries, when we go out, we are not doing God a favor. We are being instruments. We are simply going out to do God's work. Join to Our Lady, we're doing God's work. And that this work, which is God's work, is what perfects us. That we haven't done God a favor. On the contrary, we, having done what we've been asked, can only say we are unprofitable servants. We've merely done our duty. And this is how every Christian, every Catholic, should always think about themselves whenever they do a good work, a good deed. We are only doing what was asked of us, nothing more. We are unprofitable servants. Now, God, who has put the will, the desire to do good in us, when we have faithfully done it, will crown it. In other words, he will, he will bless what he has done in us. And this is our glory, that God has Despite our sinfulness, our weakness, he has saved us, despite of it, because what he has rescued in us is the work he has put in. And what is that work? That work that he has put in us is nothing other than his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. When we were baptized, we were baptized in Christ, so that we put on the new man, who is Christ. We have been dressed in Christ. We are, if you like, another Christ in the world. That's how we should live. And if we are faithful, if we, if, we, if we live out our lives united to Christ, we will be Christ. But isn't that exactly what he did for Our Lady? 
he gave, God gave to her his only begotten son so that she lived for Christ. All of her life was direct to him. And so when we look at the birth, well, even before that, when we look about, when we look at when she conceived him, Christ is now in the womb of the Virgin. What did she do? Immediately, she went to do that great work. She went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, whom she knew was in need. She, that's what she did. The next time we encounter her, she is in the temple. She's fulfilling the law of God, God's will. She brought her son to the temple. Did she receive good news? Well, the old man, the prophet Simeon said, you see this child? He's assigned to be rejected. How do you think she felt? Your son is going to be rejected. He's going to be a sign of contradiction. He's a stumbling block. A sword will pierce your own soul because of it. And so she hears this and she thinks it is God's will. When she lost her son, again, how do you think she felt? She went searching for him for three days, looking for him everywhere. And when eventually she found him in the temple, she said, my child, why have you done this to us? Don't you know your father and I have been looking for you? And she gets the response, why were you looking for me? Don't you know I should be about my father's business? And we're told by St. Luke, she pondered this, that he had to be about his father's business. So Our Lady knew whatever the Father wanted, she must want as well. God's will be done. And we, we don't meet her again until the wedding feast of Cana, where we're told that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was invited, and so was Jesus and his friends. And then she knew that the hour had come. She asks, she says to him, they have no wine. And he says, what concern is this of ours? Why bother me with this? My time has not yet come. But it was left to her to say, do what to the servants, do whatever he tells you. In other words, she was saying, I consent to the Father's will. Yes, your time has not come, but they are in need. And she consented. And our Lord worked the miracle of changing the water into wine at Our Lady's consent, and then she disappears again, until three years later, when she reappears, where? In Jerusalem. She meets her son going to Calvary. She meets her son carrying the cross. She meets her son covered in blood, with scourges all over his body, with a crown of thorns, with spittle all over his face. She meets him. Thy will be done. And she stands at the foot of the cross and she says nothing. She just stands there because she was offering her son to the eternal father for our redemption. This is what the father willed. This is what the son himself willed. Therefore, she said, thy will be done. The mother likewise willed it. And when next do we meet her? When next do we encounter her? It's when the church, the mystical body of Christ is born at Pentecost, when the disciples are gathered with her and they are praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so the church is born, of which Mary is the mother. So in all of this, we see Our Lady's whole um, life is to do the Father's will. And she does it because she kept close to the Son. So then we likewise, who have been given her Son in baptism, we should keep him as close to ourselves as possible. We should keep close to him as possible. So that our union with him is most perfect in this world. So that when we celebrate our birthday, the day we leave this world, it will truly be a birthday because we've been born into eternal life, where we will be, please God, happy forever with our blessed Lord, with his most holy mother, and with all the saints.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.